Glad you're here this morning. We're going to be continuing our verse-by-verse study in the book of Acts. If you have your Bible, open it up to Acts chapter 8. And we'll go ahead and pray. And Lord Jesus, once again, we thank you for this time that you have gathered and set aside during the week for us to um, just study your word, to search your word, to plumb the depths of it, Lord. And I pray that as we do open your word, that you would just reveal to us the things that you want each of us to know, that you would speak to our hearts, that we might draw closer to you in our walk with you, that our hearts would beat in time with yours, Lord, and that we would... um, just grow, Lord, and that, that's really the goal of the Christian life, is just to grow each day, and so I pray that this morning, as we start off a new week, that you would just speak to us loud and clear. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so last week we looked at this amazing teaching and history lesson that Stephen uh, gave to the Jewish leaders as he was brought in on these false charges. Um, He preached to them through their own history that God was not interested in religion, but he's interested in a relationship that he provided through Jesus, who they rejected just like their fathers had rejected God's deliverers and messengers all throughout their history. And for sharing this truth in love with them, guess what Stephen got? Killed. He got stoned to death. And so we're going to actually back up a little bit to chapter 7, verse 54, get a running start into uh, this week's um, study. And so it says in in verse 54 of chapter 7, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. That'd be those that Stephen was sharing the message with. And they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So you had one group, the religious leaders, full of anger, wanting to kill Stephen. And you had Stephen, who was full of the Holy Spirit. And in the middle of all this turmoil, he sees Jesus. And so he, they cried out with a loud voice. They stopped up their ears. They did one of these ah, 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 kind of things. And they, they ran at him. With one accord. And they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And Saul is going to become a key character as we move throughout the book of Acts. Uh, We'll see him in in chapter 8. And then we'll see him a little bit in chapter 9. And then there's a couple chapters of break. And then pretty much the rest of the book of Acts surrounds Saul, who will become the Apostle Paul, and his ministry um, to the church. And so Saul, he, at this point, he's one of the Jewish uh, Sanhedrin uh, leaders, council leaders, and he's consenting to the death of Stephen. He's holding on to the coats of those who are uh, stoning Stephen. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down, knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep or he died. Um, And so now as we move into chapter 8, it says, Now Saul, that's our guy, was consenting to his death or consenting to Stephen's death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. And the devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. So Saul, again, I mentioned it just a minute ago, this guy will later become the apostle Paul. But at this point, he's a zealous religious Jew. And he's part of the Sanhedrin or the ruling council. We can get that by the fact that it says that he was consenting. That means he's casting his vote. Uh, In order to put a vote forward, you had to be part of the Sanhedrin. So we know that Paul was part of that. And it says that he was consenting to this. 
And that, that word consenting can, can literally, it's not just saying, yes, I agree, go ahead, stone him. The, the idea behind this is he's literally applauding and altogether pleased that they're going to put Stephen to death. And everyone, it says, is scattered. Right? What did it say there in verse uh, 1? That they were all scattered. That they, that is being talked about, is the early church. They, for this, up to this point, they had been congregating in Jerusalem. And now due to this stoning of Stephen and the great persecution that has arisen, everybody is scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. And we're not really told why they stayed. Uh, maybe uh, one, one person I was looking at said that they thought maybe the apostles stayed because when Jesus was crucified, they had all fled. So now they're standing sort of as a, as a way to show that we're not running anymore. I, I don't really know, but it doesn't tell us. But the rest of the church is, has been scattered now. And let me just tell you something. God oftentimes will use persecution to get his people moving or hard times, trials in our lives to get his people moving. And remember what Jesus told them in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This was Jesus' instruction to the church after they received the Holy Spirit. When you receive the Holy Spirit, when he's come upon you, You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. Had they been doing that? Were they being witnesses in Jerusalem? Yeah. But also, he says, in Judea, the surrounding area, Samaria, even a little bit farther out, and to the end of the earth. But up to this point, they're only in Jerusalem. They haven't done the rest of this. And it seems like that they had become comfortable where they were at. And sometimes God uses these circumstances of our lives to get us where he wants us to be. If not for some circumstances that happens, I think oftentimes we would miss what God wants to do because we're, we're just so comfortable and things are convenient. Life is, is as normal all the time. Why do I want to rock the boat, right? I got a job, I got a house, I got whatever. Why do I want to rock that boat? So we'll just sit, even though maybe God's been showing us to do something. It doesn't always have to be, going away like we left Texas to come to Utah. It doesn't have to be a, that, but sometimes it could be just, you know, God's wanting you to do something or you feel like God's wanting you to go somewhere and maybe it takes the loss of a job and then moving to another job for that to happen or it takes some something else in your life. There's been many people who have felt the call of God to go to different places and they kind of go, eh, I don't know, and then they lose a job and then guess where they get a new job? The place where God wanted them to go in the first place. And so, you know, but it says these, these, uh, th- this circumstance of this, they were kind of holding back the persecution of the church. But now at the stoning of Stephen, it seems like, like no pun intended, like all hell has broken loose onto the church and the Jews are coming to persecute, to kill. And it says, uh, we'll learn more about Saul here in a, in a bit, but it says that devout men, carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. These devout men are most likely Jewish men because it doesn't say brothers or Christian men or followers of Christ. It says the devout men, these are most likely Jewish guys who disagreed with how the religious council had handled Stephen. And so they almost as a way to say, we we don't stand in agreement with this, so we're going to take him and make a lamentation. For And, and we have to realize that for the Jews, when a Jewish person would die, they would make great lamentation, great mourning. They would actually hire mourners to come and to wail and to make noise to show how much that person was loved. Uh, but that's not so what we see with the church, because in the church, we see that there's a hope and a trust in Jesus that when I die, I'm going to go to be with him. And so for the Christian, when there's a death, we mourn, but we're told in the New Testament, not as those who are apart from Christ. And so the fact that they're having this big lamentation indicates to me that this is probably Jews who are doing their best to just show that we don't agree with the death of Stephen because I don't think the church would have handled it this way. It was ended. He fell asleep. And to the church, that means he's now present with Jesus. And so it says that in verse 3, back to our guy Saul that we were talking about, he made havoc 
of the church. Look at what he did. He entered every house, dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. Oftentimes when there's like a wartime type thing, the women are spared, right? They, they kill the men, but they spare the women. Not here. Paul's dragging off men and women alike. Imagine now you've got what's happening to the kids. Are the kids without parents now? Uh, he's putting them in jail. Uh, and that word that's used there, havoc, it's an interesting word because it, it, it has the, the connotation of being like a wild boar. Um, and wild boars, if you know anything about them, they, they cause havoc on pretty much everything they come in contact with. And if you were to try to kill a wild boar, like with, with an arrow or a gunshot, and if you didn't get the kill shot right away, in pain and in fear, the boar wrecks even more havoc. And so you can kind of get that idea about Paul or Saul, and I'll probably flip his name interchangeably, so I apologize, but he is wounded. He's like a boar who's been wounded. He's heard the message of the gospel. He's seen Stephen's reaction. Lord, for don't charge them with this, this that they're doing to me. Much like Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And Stephen is having that same reaction. And to the, to the one who's been wounded by that, Saul, he's going off. He's going crazy. Just like a wild boar. The, the word also can be used of a military regiment who will go in and wipe out an entire city. Hold your finger there in Acts chapter 8. Flip forward a couple of chapters to Acts chapter 26. And this is after the Apostle Paul has been saved. And this is him recounting who he was at the time when Stephen was killed. And he says, indeed, in verse nine of chapter 26, indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to or against the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue. Check this out. And compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So this guy was a monster. Saul was a monster. He was a religious monster. And look what happened though, the result of the persecution, the result of them fleeing into these different cities, the result of of Saul's religious zealousness. Verse 4, therefore, and we say this a lot in church circles, when we see the word therefore, we have to ask ourselves, what is the word therefore? Therefore. Because it's, it's a conclusion word. It's giving you a conclusion to what happened before. So the result, the therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere in fear and hiding. No, they went everywhere preaching the word, the gospel, the good news of salvation, that Jesus offers forgiveness of sin and eternal life, which comes through him. And a question that I have to ask myself is how do I react when there are difficult circumstances, when things aren't going the way that I hoped? Do I continue to share the word wherever I go or do I just sulk in my circumstances? Do I, do I turn into uh, Depresso Dave or, or am I going out and continuing to just know that there's hope in Jesus in spite of my circumstances and share the word, share with people? Oftentimes God uses the circumstances of our own lives to be able to open a door to share with other people. When they, they know what's going on in your life and they, they have questions like, what, how come you're, you're not calling in sick from work every day? How come you're not like doing this? Or how come you're not on pills or whatever? Why? Because I have a hope of eternal life, right? It reminds me of uh, during Jesus's ministry where Jesus has just fed the 5,000 and he give, they, they come back across the shore and the crowds meet them and the Jesus essentially tells them the only reason you're here is for the bread that I'm giving you. And, and he tells them that, you know, that they'll have to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, speaking of communion, but the people will like kind of get weirded out. But what's he talking about? Eat his bread and drink his blood. And, and the, the, the people in the crowd, 
they just like, it says that many of the disciples departed at that. Like, wow, this is weird. We don't want to listen to that. And then Jesus looks at the 12, looks at his disciples, and he says to them, are you going to go also? And then Peter says, where else would we go, Lord? For you have the words of eternal life. There's nowhere else to go. We may have to flee because of some circumstance, a job loss, a political persecution, whatever it might be. We might have to leave for some reason, but we haven't lost our hope. Jesus is with us wherever we go. And we have this hope of eternal life that we too can now be scattered and know, well, God moved me from that place to this place. So he must want me here. If you recognize in your life that everything has to run through what has been referred to as a father filter, right? We, nothing is happening to you that God is not aware of. And, and he allows for these things to happen in our lives. And later on in Acts, we're going to learn that he allows those things to happen so that we'll get to a point in our life where we reach out for him. And it's kind of amazing, really. So as we continue on in Acts, verse 5, there, or, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. So remember back in chapter, in chapter 6, Verse 5, Philip was one of the seven men that were chosen to take care of the problem with the Hellenist widows. And remember the qualifications. There had to be men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and wisdom. And they were chosen to do a small job, serving tables, taking care of those widows. But now we see this guy, Philip, He's going down to the area of Samaria. Why, why is he going to Samaria? Context? Because of the persecution that has arisen in Jerusalem. He's been driven out. And as he gets driven out, he goes down to Samaria. And it says that when he got there, he preached Christ to them. Again, he continues teaching the word. So this guy, Philip, we see he's not just a waiter anymore. Right? Matt? Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells a parable called the parable of the talents. And he tells of a man who was going away on a journey. And he gives out talents. And in that case, it's speaking of money, but it could be any type of gift or talent that the Lord has given. But he gives talents out to his servants. To one of the servants, he gives five talents. To another of the servants, he gives two and to another of the servants, he gives just one talent. And when the master comes back from his journey, he was expecting that his servants would have done something with the talent that was given to them. And he was pleased with the two who had done something with what they were given. And he chastised the one servant who did nothing with the talent. This is what Jesus said to the two that he was pleased with. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. And then he goes on to say, enter into the joy of your Lord. And there's a, there's a spiritual principle at work in that parable and that we see here in the life of Philip. And that is no one, no one is boxed into a certain place in a certain ministry serving the Lord. If we're faithful where God has called us to be, Another term that's been used is to bloom where you're planted. And God will then entrust you with more. Be faithful with what God gives you and let God give you more. And so what did Philip do? He was faithful as a waiter, as a servant. And, and then as the persecution happens, he goes out and all of a sudden now he's not just a waiter and a servant, but now he's preaching the message of Jesus. And we're also told that he's doing miracles. The, the people were hearing and seeing miracles, which he did. Demons were being cast out. Unclean spirits were crying out the loud voice, came out of many who were possessed. And many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. So Philip is doing these miraculous miracles. Why? I'll, I'll submit all because he was faithful. He was faithful 
with the little thing that Jesus gave him to wait tables. And then as the persecution happened, he goes out and he begins to preach and he begins to do miracles and people are drawn to Jesus. Now we have to talk about the Samaritans for a minute. Who are the Samaritans? Well, the Samaritans were half Jew and half Gentile. Jews hated Samaritans. They thought of them as half-breeds. Okay, There was a racial issue going on. So does the Bible talk about racism? Yes, it does. This is where. Okay, John chapter 4, you'll remember, you can make some notes. Jesus meets with the Samaritan woman at the well. And in that account, she is shocked that Jesus is, you being a Jew are talking to me? And then also in Luke chapter 10, Jesus ta- tells another parable of the good Samaritan. And the point of it was is that this, the Samaritan who the Jews hated had more love and care for his neighbor than the Jews did. And then in Luke chapter 9, as the disciples were going out, the Samaritan, they, they went into a Samaritan village and were told that they rejected the message of Jesus. And James and John, two of Jesus' disciples, they come back and they're like, hey, those Samaritans rejected you. Do you want us to call down fire from heaven and torch them? And Jesus, he kind of he laughs, I think, and he says, you don't, you don't know what spirit you're of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Jesus didn't come to destroy people's lives. He came to save people's lives. And so Samaritans, they came about during the time of the Assyrian captivity. Now the Assyrians, what they would do when they would capture a people group is that they would move the people group out of a land and they would repopulate the land with Assyrians and other people groups. And when this happened, you can read the account in 2 Kings chapter 17, but the people that were repopulating the land, lions, like actual lions, began to attack and kill them. And they realized, they had this realization, it's because we don't know how to worship the God of this land. And so what did they do? They sent back to Assyria and said, hey, send some of the priests from Israel back over here so we can learn how to worship the God of their land and these lions will stop attacking us. And so they do. They send some of the priests back and they teach them how to worship God. But the problem was that they didn't just worship the God of Israel. They mixed the worship of the God of Israel with the worship of foreign gods from all over the place. And with that, they got this religious stew. And they they really didn't know what they worshipped. And again, that's evident in the account of Jesus with the woman at the the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4. So that's who the Samaritans are, hated by the Jews. You notice that Jesus said you're going to go to Samaria, but they weren't jumping out of Jerusalem to go and share with the Samaritans. Why? Because there was a racial divide. It'd be much like the South in in the 60s here in the United States. There wasn't a whole lot of white people going into the black community to share the gospel because they didn't like them. There was a racial divide. And so that's a problem because the Bible says that when you get saved, there is no more Jew or Gentile, male or female, slave or free, that we're all one in Christ. Not to mention that all the way back in Genesis, when man was created, man was created in the image of God. And in the image of God, they were created, it says male and female. It doesn't say anything about uh, race there. And so what was the result of all that was happening People are being healed. The word of God is being sown. Verse 8, there was great joy in the city. Joy is greater than happiness. Okay, I don't know. You make those little symbols in math, you know, you put joy on one side and a little greater than symbol. And remember the, the big side is greater than. If you have the little side, it's less than. But joy is greater than uh, happiness. Why? Because joy is deep within, and it comes from the hope of knowing that Jesus has saved me, that my sin debt, which is unpayable, has been removed, 
and that I have eternal life to look forward to. Joy is greater than happiness. Happiness is emotion. We've got one little guy up in our nursery ministry right now, and he hangs out with us quite a bit, Huddy. And every now and then, Huddy's crying, and within the next second, he's laughing. You almost can't tell the difference. And then he'll be really happy and laughing. And then the next second he's crying. Happiness is an emotion. It just goes up and down. Joy is a constant that stays with us. And we have joy because we know that we have hope that we will be with Jesus. And so that's the difference. So these people have joy, not happiness. And and we shouldn't confuse the two. Now, Still continuing, as Philip is here in Samaria, we're going to look at another guy here starting in verse 9. This is a little bit of an interesting account. So it says, But there was a certain man called Simon, and this is not to be confused with Simon Peter, because we're going to see Peter later on in this story. But right now we're looking at this guy named Simon. And by the way, the name Simon means shifting sand. So don't name anybody Simon. It'll be a little squirrely. But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. So it says that there's that we're introduced to Simon and it says that he previously practiced sorcery. What is sorcery? It's demonic is what it is. Sorcery is often involved, often done involving the use of mind-altering drugs. From cover to cover in the Bible, it warns against sorcery. Anything that witchcraft, crystals like the New Age movement, energy, um, same thing. Not like energy drinks, but like, you know, the crystals cause you to have good energy or bad energy. Uh, the Wiccans, the Black Arts. Ouija boards, tarot cards, psychics, horoscopes, it's all demonic. And it's all dealing with the demonic realm. And the demonic realm does have real power and can imitate miracles. If you look all the way back to the story of the Exodus, when Moses uh, had his staff and he cast his staff down on the ground and it turned into a snake, Pharaoh's magicians sorcerers they also threw sticks down and turned them they turned into snakes but then of course pharaoh's i mean moses's snake ate pharaoh's snakes but uh but the point being is that they could mimic they can do there is power in the demonic realm and we need to note about this guy um uh, simon is that it says that he previously practiced that means he's no longer doing it and um, it says that the, the sorceries that he did astonished the people. The King James Version translates that word astonished as bewitched them, right? Remember the show, Samantha and beep, 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 you know, her little nose? Ma'am, too, you guys are too young for that. But, but verse 12, it says, now what's happening is when the people are believing Philip. They're hearing the message of the kingdom of God. They're seeing the miracles that Philip has done and they're getting saved and they're no longer paying attention to Simon the sorcerer. And it says that Simon himself also believed. Wait a minute, you mean a guy who is involved in demonic stuff and witchcraft can get saved? Yeah, absolutely. Jesus will save anybody. And So I think this is awesome because the word it says where it says some will argue this portion of scripture and say that they don't believe Simon was really saved. I disagree with that wholeheartedly. I think based on the text and what's said that he is saved. But we'll talk about that he's he's saved, but he's still on the hot mess express. Okay, and so he's he's says he believed. And the word that said where it says he believed is the same word that's used 
of the others who were believing. And it says that he was baptized and that he continued with Philip. And he himself, this guy who was doing all this sorcery, witchcraft, maybe some sleight of hand type magic stuff. But he sees the miracles and the signs which were being done. And he himself is amazed. And so uh, we need to talk about the word believed because the people were believing. Simon was believing. Later on, we're going to see believed again. The New Testament understanding of the word believe is different from our simple English word of believe. If we're talking biblically, like what the Bible says, to believe means to do. It's, it's, it's a reality in my life. We can, have, we can believe in something with head knowledge, right? I, I believe that I am going to be a millionaire one day. But if I'm not doing anything in the stock market or anything saving up for retirement or whatever, I, buying real estate, I'm probably not going to be a millionaire one day. I don't really believe that. So what do I mean? So if I, let me give you an example that I often use. I don't mean to scare anybody, but if I said right now, Hey, I guys want everybody to be calm. There's a bomb in here. We've got two minutes till the bomb goes off, but you know what? Just relax. Let's finish the Bible study. I don't believe that there's a bomb in here, but if I said, Hey, look, I just got a message. There's, there's a bomb in here. It's a legit concern. We have two minutes. Let's calmly, let's stand up. Everybody right now, stand up. Let, let's get moving. Let's go out of the house. And now you guys would say, oh, he believes there's a bomb because there's action behind what I say, right? And there's a lot of people who say, oh, I believe in Jesus, but the action of my life doesn't prove that I believe anything. And so they're, biblically speaking, their believe carries with it action. And so these people were believing and they were baptized. Baptism, I think sometimes today we do baptisms as sort of like a, like part two of your salvation. It's not really part two. You're saved by faith and trust in Jesus alone. But baptism is an outward display of what is happening already in our hearts. And we'll talk about more of that later in the next portion of the uh, chapter. But Simon, it says, we're told this guy he also believed he was baptized. And again, like I said, I believe that he was already saved, but he, he was previously practicing sorcery. Philip would not have baptized him if he didn't believe that he was saved. We don't, we're not just in the business of baptizing people for numbers sake. At least I'm not. I want to know that you have a relationship with Jesus before I will baptize you. If you placed your trust in Jesus and you want to get baptized, and we'll do it. Okay. Just let me know because i got to buy a tub for to baptize you in. Uh, <laughs> uh, verse 14. So still talking about Samaria, still following up with our guy Simon. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem, so that's the guys who stayed in Jerusalem, they heard that Samaria had received the word of God and they sent Peter and John to them. So somehow this went viral. It got back. It, it wasn't by, you know, social media because they didn't have it back then, but uh, it went viral. The message got over to, from Samaria to Jerusalem and they hear the message that these Samaritans, remember the ones that they hated have gotten saved. And so they send Peter and John, two of the apostles down to check it out. And it says in verse 15, who, when they had come, they prayed for them, for the Samaritans, that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only believed, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So word spreads, Peter and John come and, you know, previously, as we talked about, John chapter 4, Luke chapter 10, Peter and John were part of the crew that didn't want to be there. When it said that Jesus in John chapter 4, he went out of his way to go through Samaria to meet this woman at the well. When, when they get there, the disciples are shocked. What is he doing talking to this Samaritan woman? Luke chapter 10, they wanted to call down fire. That was actually James and his brother John, the guy who's right here, who wanted to call down fire to burn up the Samaritans. 
And you can see now they're coming to check it out. Now they're going to get there. They're going to pray with the people. They're going to lay hands on them and pray that they receive the Holy Spirit. You know what's happening? God is dealing with the racial issues that were there within the church. There's no place for it. Racism is not not a skin issue. It is a sin issue. If you have problems with people because of the color of their skin, then you have a problem in your heart that you need to deal with with God. But it says that they received the Holy Spirit. And every time we'll see it again when, when the Gentile believers or the non-Jews, the Samaritans were half-breed, Gentiles were just not Jew at all. When, when the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit, every time that a different group receives the Holy Spirit to those Jews who became Christians, it was an eye-opening experience that God isn't just working with us. He's working with everyone. Salvation is for everyone. Just like we got saved and received the Holy Spirit, so are these people that we used to think were only fuel for the fire of hell. And that's what Jews believed about Samaritans and Gentiles. But they received the Holy Spirit. And one of the things I want to point out about that is this is once again evidence of a separate working of God in the filling of the Holy Spirit. When someone is saved upon salvation, the Holy Spirit comes in to the believer But there's a second working, which is called the filling or the overflowing of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're witnessing here. The disciples, the the early apostles in Acts chapter 2, they were saved. They believed in Jesus. He had filled them or he had given them the Holy Spirit but they weren't overflowing yet until the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was given. Now we're seeing it again. These believers were saved and baptized, but they, they didn't have the overflowing of the Holy Spirit in their life. And so when, the, when Simon and, or when, I'm sorry, when Peter and John come and they pray and lay hands on them, the Holy Spirit is given. And it says that they received the Holy Spirit. They're, in verse 18, when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So there, Simon saw what occurred. That tells me that there was some evidence that the Holy Spirit was given. We're just not told what that evidence was. You know, in the, on the day of Pentecost, we're told that they spoke in tongues. That was the evidence. But here we're told they get the Holy Spirit, but there's no mention of tongues or anything specific. But obviously something happened that Simon noticed. And he offers to buy the the power, right? And this was something that magicians would do and still do. They would trade trade secrets. They would buy them from one another so that, that now I can do the trick when I'm on stage or whatever. And so maybe that's what his thought process was. But his problem is that he seeks to buy the Holy Spirit. He sees the Holy Spirit as something like a magic trick. He wants the power and the authority that the apostles had, which seems to have been lost to him upon Philip preaching about Jesus, upon Simon being saved and the people in Samaria being saved. They're no longer following him. They're no longer looking at him as, wow, what a guy. Look at those magic tricks he does. That's, that's amazing. Wow, he must be the hand of God. Now they've seen somebody else do and they're not following him anymore. And rather than letting the person of the Holy Spirit control his life, Simon wants the power without and authority for personal ends. He wants to use the power of the Holy Spirit for personal means or personal gain. He definitely has a misunderstanding of the Holy Spirit. And there are many today who have this type of misunderstanding. We see it in churches all across the country where they attribute things to the Holy Spirit that don't belong to the Holy Spirit. And so he definitely has that misunderstanding. Now, verse 20, Peter's going to give him a harsh rebuke. Peter said to him, your money perish with you. Because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Peter gives him this harsh rebuke, and none of us likes to be rebuked. But this is a much needed rebuke. When, and you remember in John chapter 13, 
when Jesus is getting ready to wash his disciples' feet and he gets to Peter, Peter says, oh, no, no, Lord, you're not washing my feet. Huh? You're, you're not doing that job. And then Jesus tells Peter, almost the same thing Peter tells this guy is that, Peter, if you don't let me wash your feet, you have no part in me. He told Simon, you have no part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right with God. It didn't mean that Peter wasn't saved when Jesus told him that. And it doesn't mean that Simon's not saved because he's getting this rebuke. What it means is that they're out, their thinking is outside of the will of God. The same was true for Peter as it is for Simon here. So in verse 22, Peter's going to give him the solution. He says, repent, therefore, of this your wickedness and pray God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. So the solution to his heart not being right in the sight of God? Repent. You know what the solution is if my heart is not right in the sight of God? Repent. You know what it is if your heart is not right in the sight of God? Repent. It's the same. Repent means to turn, to do a 180 degree turn from the way you were going. It means that God's right, I'm wrong, I was going this way, now I'm going to go that way. Simon, we have to remember about this guy, because again, I said many people read this and they think, well, this guy wasn't saved. He got rebuked by Peter and it said he believed and he was baptized. We have to remember this. Simon is a brand new believer. He's a baby in his relationship with Jesus. And just like our babies, they don't get everything all at once. It's a process of learning and growing. They don't come out of the womb walking and talking and doing all kinds of stuff. They have to learn. They, they start out you know, squawking on the ground or on the crib. They can't do anything for themselves to getting up on their knees and crawling, to standing, to taking steps to being able to feed themselves. It's a learning process. And much like we are in our relationship with Christ, when we get saved, we're babies. We have to grow. Simon's a baby. And uh, Simon and anybody, for that matter, getting saved does not necessarily mean that we immediately jump off that hot mess express. Right? Who's, I'm a hot mess. A lot of us are a hot mess. And, and we get saved that doesn't mean that the, the hot mess just ends that day. It's a process. That process is called sanctification. That, it's a big word that means being made into the likeness of Jesus. And it's a lifelong process. When does sanctification end? It ends when the believer in Jesus dies and goes to heaven and we're perfected. Until then, sanctification is happening all along. That's why we're never going to be perfect. Now, verse 23 Peter tells us that his problem was that he is poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Peter just met him. How does he know this? This is what we would call a word of knowledge from the Holy Spirit. And the, the bottom line is there was an issue with Simon's heart that needed to be dealt with. And this issue is often true for us as well if we don't allow Jesus to deal with these things in our hearts. If we don't allow Jesus to deal with the bitterness and the poison, then the, the, we, we stay bound in that. We stay prisoner to that when Jesus wants to set us free. It will stunt our growth as Christians. I always want to err on the side of grace. We don't really know what became of Simon. There is some church history that says what happened to him, but the Bible doesn't tell us what became of him. I like to err on the side of grace. One of two things is true, though. He's either going to repent and get right with God, or he went on in life to stay in his bitterness and his iniquity. And, you know, I, I had an issue like this at one point where I was saved. I was born again, but I pretty much hated everybody. It doesn't line up with what God's word says. And our pastor in Houston was teaching from 1 John chapter 4, where the, the scripture is beloved let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God. He that loveth not knows not God, because God is love. And when he read those scriptures, it was like 
I felt like, Simon, you're full of poison and bitterness. And they're like, oh, man, got me. What was the key? Repent. Oh, Lord, he's right. You're right. I'm wrong. I need to be forgiven. I need you to deal with my heart. And God deals with our hearts. We just have to turn it over to him. And verse 25, it says, When they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem. That would be Peter and John preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. So we know that Peter and John's hearts have changed because now they're preaching the gospel to people they once hated. And if Jesus, it's Jesus who changes our hearts. We can put on a mask for any prejudices that we have. But it is knowing Jesus that changes who we are. It's spending time with him. He changes who we are. Verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road, which goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship was returning and sitting in his chariot. He was reading Isaiah, the prophet. Then the spirit of the, the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. Philip gets a message. The angel of the Lord, an angel of the Lord, common garden variety angel talks to Philip and he says, go to the South along the road, which is from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. Philip didn't argue. Why not? It would have been easy, right? He, he's in Samaria. He's got a thriving ministry. People are getting saved. Miracles are happening. He's, it, multitudes of people are now coming and hearing the message about the kingdom of God. And God tells them, hey, get up from where you are. I'm sending you somewhere else. What? But why, God? Everything's going well here. It'd be so easy for him just to stay. But Jesus calls him to the desert with no other information. Isn't that awesome? You want me to leave everything I know and go where there's no information other than I'm going to the desert. John Corson, another pastor, he says it like this. If you struggle with finding God's will, know this. God's will is for you to obey him one step at a time. He does not give us the full story. And it's like, man, we want to know the full story all the time. Right up front, we want to know everything, but God doesn't do it that way. He gives us one step at a time. And he gets this command to go to the desert. What did Philip do? He arose and he went. And God is faithful to give us what we need one step at a time. And I found this in my own life that if I don't, I won't get the instructions for step two unless I take step one. Once I take step one, then all of a sudden step two comes into focus. So this, this guy that he's going to meet, we're told is an Ethiopian eunuch. So he's from Ethiopia. A eunuch means that he's been castrated. Most likely uh, they would do this to people, men who were not part of the royal line, who were serving within the royal family because there would be no threat that he could have a relationship with the queen and, and have a mixed uh, mess up the bloodline, so to speak, of the, um, the royal family. And so he's a powerful man, though. He's in charge of the money in the kingdom. He's riding in a chariot. He has his own scroll, which would be very rare because they were super expensive. Uh, he was we're told seeking the God of Israel. He went to Jerusalem to worship and he's obviously missed something. Whatever he was looking for in Israel at Jerusalem, he didn't find, right? There's been a lot of songs written like that. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Uh, Mick Jagger wrote a song a long, long time ago. I can't get no satisfaction, right? Because we're looking for something that only Jesus can fill. And so here, this guy's looking for the answers and he's, he's going and he's trying to find it and he can't figure out what it is. He's reading the chariot. He's reading inside of his chariot. Obviously he wasn't driving. Can't drive and read at the same time. And, and they're going. And God tells Philip, go near and overtake the chariot. And I'm like, wait, Philip's on foot. The chariot's like on wheels. I get this vision in my mind like Dash from The Incredibles. He's like, like right up alongside the, 
the chariot. But this is step two. Step one, go. Step two, get up alongside the chariot. And when he gets up there, check out what he hears. Verse 30. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? So Philip, step one, go. Step two, run up there. He runs up there. Now he knows step three because he hears what the guy's reading. And he asks him, hey, do you understand what you're reading about? And, and the, the Ethiopian answers him, how can I understand unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. That's what we call in Christian world, we call this an open door. Someone, someone says, yeah, I've, I've been reading my Bible and I just don't understand. It's all Greek to me, man. I need someone to help me understand this. If someone says that to you, that's the time to go, oh God, I think you want me to do something here. This is an open door. I go show them. And, and it just so happened that the, the guy is reading in Isaiah 53, and he says, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth? So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask of you, whom does the prophet say this of, himself or of some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. And so he's reading this passage. It's no coincidence. It's a passage, Isaiah 53, which is all about Jesus. The, if you were to talk to a Jew about Isaiah 53 today, number one, the Jews don't study this passage because it so clearly points to Jesus. But they try to, they try to, talk it away like oh it's talking about the nation of israel not not jesus and you know it's they they totally take it out of context if you read it it's very clearly about jesus isaiah 53 and there's no coincidence that he's in this place reading this spot in scripture god do you guys know that god does awesome stuff like this when this one man just one guy was as important to jesus as the whole region of the Samaritans. He took Philip, who was sharing the gospel with the whole region of people, all the way out to Gaza to meet with one person. That one guy is just as important as a whole region of people in God's sight. And I've, I've seen this type of thing happen in my own life, my own ministry. There's a, there's a young lady that I'm not going to mention by name. I checked with her this week and she said, it was okay if I tell this story. But when I was working in law enforcement in Houston, I was part of a mental health uh, um, investigative team. And we had an incident happen with one of the students in our school. And we had to go follow up at her house with her family. And we get there to the house and, you know, her mom opens the door. We talk to the mom and her, her sister is there. And her sister's the one who's the focus of the this story. So the sister... I'm t we're talking to the mom. It's, it's, the mom was a Spanish speaker, so my partner was talking to her in Spanish, and I'm just kind of standing there. And I noticed the whole time, the sister's just kind of doing one of these numbers, like, like looking at me. And then finally she's like, do I know you from somewhere? And I'm like, I don't think so. And then, then she says, maybe, I said, I said, I don't know, that maybe from church? And she's like, that's it. She goes, do you go to Calvary Chapel, West Houston? And I said, yeah. And, and uh, she goes, that's what it is, right? And so anyway, we ended up talking to the family. And I could tell that she was very bothered by the things that we were talking about. So she had moved into the living room. My partner was dealing with the, the mom talking in Spanish. This is what I call an open door, right? What scripture? Are you, do you know what this means? Tell me what this means. The girl's like, I know you from church and you're in my house in this terrible situation. That's an open door, okay? So... I, I go over and I sit down and I start talking to her. I said, so how, how are you doing? How's your walk with the Lord going? You know, she says to me, right before you knocked on the door, I was up in my room praying, God, if you're real, will you give me a sign? And then here I came knocking on the door. And she was broken down at that point. But it was so awesome to see that God will reach out to a person who is seeking him genuinely not it's not just about the masses of people but even one and and god just like he was interested 
in, uh, what's his name? Not Simon, the Ethiopian, that one guy, he was also interested in that one person that I showed up and talked to. So let me just encourage you in this. Be bold for Jesus. Be bold to think of your life as being on the mission field, being on mission, right? And when I, when I say being on mission here in Utah, that has a whole different connotation than it does everywhere else in the church world. But the idea is that I'm on mission for Jesus wherever I go. And so not just a church mission trip or not just at church, but every day be open and available for God to use you and pray that God would give you open doors just like he gave me that day, just like he's given uh, Philip here in this account. And so verse 34, it says, So the eunuch answers Philip, and wants to know who he's speaking. I think I read that already. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at the scripture he was reading, he tells him about Jesus. In verse 36, now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. So again, this is an open door. I encourage you go through open doors when Jesus gives them to you and tell people about Jesus. Just be bold about it. You don't have to be shy. And at a minimum, do this. If you don't know what to say or you're afraid you don't know what to say, invite people to church because I'm going to tell them about Jesus. And they're going to hear about Jesus. They're going to hear the gospel. And Philip went on to preach Jesus, not religion, to this man. He didn't preach a system of rules and regulations of do's and don'ts. He preached the hope that is found in Jesus alone through a personal relationship. And then the man wants to be baptized. And Philip says to him, if you believe with all your heart, then you can be baptized. And remember, believe, we talked about earlier, is more than just a head knowledge of understanding, but there is a tangibility to biblical belief in Jesus. Action follows belief because they go hand in hand. And in Romans chapter 10, I'm going to turn over there. You don't have to turn there. Uh, Romans chapter 10, if I can get my pages to cooperate. Verse 9 It says this, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's no hoops to jump through. It's a matter of belief. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. It's it's the condition of the heart because obviously then the question is, what about people who are mute and they can't talk and they can't confess with their mouth? Okay, it's the heart. Do you believe that Jesus is who he says he is? If you do, say, I want to place my trust in you. That's it. You're saved. You're qualified now for the kingdom of God. You're also qualified for baptism. And so he baptized him. And we baptize in the church. We baptize believers in Jesus. Baptism is an outward showing of what has happened on the inside of your heart. It's not just like step two. It's not, and unfortunately some churches treat it that way where you got, you went forward and you you got saved. And then the next thing they want to do is put you in the baptismal to be baptized. It doesn't have to go like that. Baptism doesn't save you. Your faith and trust in Jesus saves you. So it's an outward showing of what's already going on inside. So if you don't believe and you get baptized, guess what? All you are is wet. We don't baptize babies like some churches do because baptism is for those who have made a choice to follow Jesus. What do we do with babies? We love babies. We dedicate babies. We, we pray for them and we dedicate their lives to the Lord, but we don't baptize babies. We baptize believers who have made a choice to follow Jesus. So verse 39, as we finish this out, it's an amazing scene. When they came up out of the water, so here they come, he dunks them, comes up out of the water. The Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. Literally, he he, uh, raptured him. Harpazo is the word in Greek, the same word that is used uh, for when Jesus raptures the church. 
but he caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. The, the Ethiopian, this is evidence that his trust was in Jesus, not in Philip. Because sometimes we have people who trust not so much in Jesus, but they trust in their church or their pastor. And they follow their church and their pastor. And if something happens with their church or their pastor, then all of a sudden they tank in their walk with Jesus. This guy had every reason to want to follow Philip, but Philip was taken away. And the guy's like, sweet, I'm saved. And he's going on rejoicing. His trust is in Jesus. But Philip was found. So Philip didn't like get caught up to heaven. He gets moved to Azotus. I don't know how this worked. The, the spirit of God just took him and moved him from one location to the other. This is like, like a good distance apart. And uh, passing through there, he, uh, Azotus, by the way, is, is the former city of the Phil- Philistines, not the Philippines, the Philistines called Ashdod that we read about in the Old Testament. But he takes him to Azotus and then passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So this amazing scene, Holy Spirit just picks Philip up, moves him. Why? The job was done. Do you realize that this Ethiopian went back to Egypt carrying his newfound faith with him? Today in Egypt, I mean to Ethiopia, but today in Egypt, there's a group called the Coptic Christians. And um, they're, they're primarily an Egyptian group of Christians, but they trace their faith back to this Ethiopian that Philip ministered to. So why was one person important? Because one person was going to take his faith and share it as well. And so <clears throat> he takes him to Azotus, and then Philip begins to travel north from there until he ends up in Caesarea, which uh, uh, is up in the northern part of Israel. That is Gentile country. It's not Jewish country. And Philip apparently remains there and continues his ministry If we look at Acts chapter 21, we'll get to it eventually, but Acts chapter 21, verse 8, tells us a little bit more about Philip. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. So he passed on. To the next generation they were his daughters were prophetesses and philip was apparently continuing ministry but he'd settled there in the area of caesarea so it's pretty awesome as we look at this to see how god moves that god's interested in the multitudes god's interested in the one again reminds me of jesus who who told the story about the the sheep you have 99 sheep who are safe you'll leave the 99 to go after the one. And that's what, what Jesus did here. He left the 99 to go after the one. He took Philip in a thriving ministry and moved him to go grab just one. And that, that speaks to me because at some point I was the one, you were the one. Jesus is concerned about you as much as he is churches full of a thousand people. He's, he's also concerned about one. And so be bold. Be bold for Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the time in your word. We thank you for the things that you want to show us. I pray that you would empower us, fill us like you did um, the Samaritans with the Holy Spirit, that we would be witnesses, God, that our lives would be lives of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, just ready to go and to share the hope that you offer at any time when we have those open doors. God, you don't tell us to beat doors down. You just expect that we'll go through the open ones. And so I pray that you'd help us to do that, help us to have boldness, and that you would be with your people this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.